You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. What's going on, everybody? I'm Panama Jackson, host of the Dear Culture Podcast at the Griot Black Podcast Network. And I'm here to tell you that two of our podcasts, The Griot Daily with Michael Harriet and Being Black the 80s with Teray, have been nominated for Signal Awards. I'm so proud of the homies that I need you to help them win. You can vote for them by scanning these QR codes. And make sure you like and subscribe to the content so that you never miss an episode of all this wonderful, amazing Black content. Thanks for listening. Make sure you vote. Have a Black one. Hello and welcome to another episode of Writing Black here on The Griot. I am, as always, your host, Maisha Kai. And if this is your first time tuning in, or if you just haven't been with us for a while, you can catch up on all episodes of Writing Black on the Griot Black Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, today is uh, a special one for me. I always love hosting members of the Griot fam here on the podcast. Um, and this person, our guest today, has actually been a colleague and a friend of mine for quite a while. And so I couldn't be more excited to promote and um, dig into his first book, Black AF History, The Unwhitewashed Story of America by Michael the Harriet. That's right. King of the uh, Twitter thread. Well, the app formerly known as Twitter. Um, political commentator, writer, poet, and just all around dope human being. Michael, thank you for coming and joining us on Writing Black. We're so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. I feel like this is uh, like... Uh, I'm at your mama's house because we talk all the time, but um, <laughs> like we're recording now and people are watching. I thought the same thing. I was like, you know, we are colleagues. We've been colleagues at more than one uh, outlet at this point. Uh, you are part of the reason. You are the reason I am part of the Griot fam. So thank you for that. Oh. Um, you are also one of the most brilliant people I know. And uh, I learned something from you all of the time. And that you can't say that about everybody. And so I'm so excited. I, you know, I know this has been a long time coming. This book is, it really is amazing. It's such an undertaking. I, I almost don't even know where to begin because there's so much in here. But where I guess I would really begin, because this is your first, <laughs> is um, tell me about why this was the project to embark on as your first, like, you know, major offering. Um, why? Because this is a very dense history. Why was this the one to go? So it wasn't supposed to be uh, the first book, right? So when I pitched, uh, pit, you pitch publishers, and when I pitched a book, I pitched a book called White Peopleology. Uh, some back when I used to teach a class called Race as an Economic Construct, and I was pitching a book based on kind of what I taught, what I had been covering and writing about for years. And every time I went to, you know, had a meeting with the publisher, they were like, yeah, like, we, we love it. We love the idea. Hey, what about that history thing you keep doing? And so uh, the one book deal became a two book deal. And after, you know, we signed the two book deal, they, uh, I think, you know, I had titles in my head and the title for the book about white people, that was White Peopleology. Uh, that was the original title. Uh, of the f book I pitched, and they didn't understand the subtitle. It was like, and you know, when I explained it, they were like, nobody's ever heard, nobody's ever heard of that. I don't know if people would be interested in that. And the subtitle was called Toward a More Critical Race Theory. But nobody had ever heard of critical race theory at the time. So there's like, nah, let's, so we flipped the order of the books. We flipped uh, and did, you know, white peopleology first, I mean, second, and did black AF history first. So that's how it was, became the, the title in, of my first book. That was how the order flipped. And so here we are. And here we are. Uh, you know, that is <laughs> a fascinating story. It also, you know, really, to me, speaks to something else that I always find remarkable about you. I mean, because even flipping these books, you still managed to, it is an uncanny ability, and it's probably why you're such a great writer, you managed to tap into a moment 
that we're having. I'm sure when you started writing this book, I mean, we already knew that there was an assault on um, black books, black history, et cetera, but not in the kind of concerted effort that we've been seeing lately, which, you know, as you illustrate here, is unparalleled since other eras. Like, you know, we're, we, we've like di- turned the dial back decades and in some cases centuries with this. So as you're writing this, you know, I'm sitting here, I, you know, I have, the, I have a page open here uh, where you're talking about David Walker, who, uh, ha- who wrote Walker's Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World. And this quote stood out to me, that the bare name of educating the colored people scares our cruel oppressors almost to death. And here we are in that moment. Who, do you, who are you writing this book for? Who, who is this for? Who, how are you hoping that this gets used? So I think I'm writing it to and for Black people. I think throughout uh, my writing career, I have always kind of been not necessarily a voice for Black people, but have you ever been somewhere and like you heard a noise or saw something and you're like, hey, hey did anybody see that but me? Or is anybody hearing that buzz but me? And sometimes you'll think you're crazy because you hear it or you see it and no one else does. And like, I've been lucky enough to have platforms where I I can write and explain that, hey, no, you're not crazy. Everybody sees it. The thing that you're hearing, (laughs) everybody's hearing it. You're not crazy. And that's kind of what this book is. And it's, it's stuff that a lot of black people know. It's a lot of stuff that we don't know, but it is a way of talking and relating our history and not necessarily the history of black people, right? Like one of the things Mm -hmm. I think is that there are a lot of books about black history, but this is a book about how black people see this country, right? And so I, what I'm saying is, hey, you're not crazy when you think this country, um, you know, it's always been uh, oppressive to black people. You're not crazy when you are wondering why this thing is the way it is. Here is why it is the way it is. And you're not crazy for thinking that. So it's a book to black people and it is for black people. All right. Well, we'll be back with more Writing Black. Y'all, come look at what Michael Harriet just posted. Black Twitter, come get your man. It's his podcast episodes for me. I was today years old when I found out Michael Harriet had a podcast. Subscribed. I'm world famous white peopleologist Michael Harriet, and this is The Grio Daily. That's right, the Black Twitter King has a podcast, The Grio Daily with Michael Harriet, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Grio Black Podcast Network and accessible wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Okay, and we are back with more writing black. It is definitely affirming, it is definitely validating. I think, you know, we know that America for black people. For a lot of people, but particularly for black people, is kind of one long gaslighting experience. I do wonder, like, do you, I mean, I I know personally that everything you do is for black people, but um, do you do you think about, or I mean, I don't know if concern's the right word, but obviously the people who probably most need to read this book won't. Like, do you ever, is there any concern about preaching to the choir? Is there any sense of like, how do we get this into the hands of people who really need this information? Or are they just, you know, is that not our problem? Yeah, I don't think that it is black people's problem. I I mean, so one of the things that makes me comfortable about doing what I do is knowing that I don't know how to do, like I don't know how to talk to white people and uh, get them to believe things they don't, don't believe or explain things to them that they don't believe. You know, you know this, but... I was raised, I was homeschooled, raised in a black family, in a black neighborhood. And so, um, you know, one of the things I joke about, uh, I jokingly call myself a white peopleologist, but it's not really a joke. It is because, like, when I started going to public school, I had to, I realized that I had to be intentional about learning about white people, right? Like, I never kind of understood this subconscious deference that a lot of people have, the whiteness. And so I never learned it, right? It's not, you know, inherent Mm -hmm. to me. And so I know that I just, like, I don't know how to talk to white people to get them to understand things, right? I talk to white people 
like I talk to black people. And so, like, if white, I'm not saying I don't want black, white people to buy this book, but I am writing and have always written to black people. And so, mm -hmm. uh, the people who, like, like, it's not like I, you know, went out to a place and unearthed new information or had an archaeological dig, right? Like, this information is available to people, maybe not in this format, right? But the people who resist this kind of information, I don't know if there's a thing that I can say that can make them change their mind. And if there is, like, I'm probably not the person they're going to listen to. So... I'm free of that responsibility or that burden. And so uh, I really can't be concerned with that when you're writing something to black people. Yeah, you know, and I love that answer. I think it's a fair answer and, and it's an accurate answer. I, I do think it's probably, it's probably not our problem, but I also am of that mindset. Like W. Kamau Bell, who gave a blurb for your book and said, I, I, there's a part of me that's like wishing I can get a case of this to Ron DeSantis, a case of these books. Um, we're going to talk about that and more when we return in just a second with more Michael Harriet and more Writing Black. What's up, Griot family? It's Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor at The Griot and host of The Blackest Questions. I want to tell you about the Signal Awards. Two of my podcast siblings are nominated. Michael Harriet, host of The Griot Daily. You know I love going on his podcast and talking about all things politics. And Tere, host of Being Black, The 80s. I'm on two episodes with Tere, talking about all things hip-hop and the 1980s. Please make sure you hit up the QR code or go to the website and vote at the Signal Awards to make sure they are represented and represented well. Thanks. All right, we are back with my griot fam, Michael Harriet, who is uh, set to publish his first book, Black AF History. This is so brilliant. Um, it is, it's been a long time in the making. There's a ton of research here. And you know, you are so generous with your knowledge. I mean, you know, you have for years been, you know, whether it's in an article or a Twitter thread, you know, you've been breaking down these things for us. But like, I always find myself, and this is a writing question, like, where do you find the time? <laughs> like, is this just like in your head? Is there like a structure that you have in terms of like, I'm going to spend this many hours a day studying? Um, is this a result of your upbringing? I mean, your breadth of knowledge is so intense. And I know that, you know, books don't get written or published alone. So feel free to shout out some of those folks if you need to. But Something like this that's so dense and so fact-checked and footnotes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, historical writing is such a specific thing because you have to get it right. Um, what is your process there? Like, what drives you? What? How do you? How do you structure this? How do you get it done? So the structure is well. I teamed with uh, a historian, uh, Blair Kelly, whose book Black Folk is out now. Shout out to Blair Kelly. Uh, uh -huh. So she basically <laughs> gave me a curriculum and said, okay. hey, uh, these are going to be, this is how we're going to break down the history, right? And we broke it down into what was initially 13 chapters. And this chapter is going to cover this period of time and this topic. And she, for each of those chapters, she gave me a curriculum. This is what you should talk about. This is what you should uh, study. And so some of the stuff I knew, some of the stuff I'd never heard of, and I would have to research. And I, you know, <laughs> we used primary sources and researched it. And then from there, you take it and just, and you translate it into storytelling, which is what kind of this book really is, right? Like a storytelling exercise. Uh -huh. and, and so how does it relate to me? How does it relate to my family? How does it relate to Black right. people in general, right? And so... Uh, interestingly, the time part of, right? So when I first started writing, I decided to do this thing because uh, I had read about it called biphasic sleep. And like, I'm a person who goes down rabbit holes. Like if something kind of just piques my interest, I'll go down a rabbit hole and I'll be like 20 subjects away by the end. So I'd Same. read about- Too this many tabs open. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'd read about this thing called biphasic sleep, which is, right, like supposedly, like for most of human history, there were no light bulbs, you know, you had candles, but you can't, you know, 
light a candle and just use candles uh, whenever you want. So we would go to sleep when the sun went down. And we mm -hmm. would sleep for like three, four hours, wake up in the middle of the night, which is what they call the witching hour. And that's when we would read the Bible. That's when children were made. That's when some people would uh, work on the farm and milk cows because like the cows would be asleep so they were easier to handle. And so I got on this biphasic sleep check uh, where I would work during the day, right, for the Grio, wherever I was working, and then sleep for like three hours, wake up in the middle of the night, right, work on the book, and then sleep again, wake up in the morning and do the same thing over and over. I am still on that sleep cycle. I can't get out of it because it actually works, right? Um, you feel, first of all, you know, like when you sleep for a long time, you wake up kind of groggy uh, with this biphasic sleep, like you have to pop back up like you just took a nap, kind of. And so um, you get your REM sleep, but you get it in small doses. And then that middle witching hour, you're kind of fresh, you're wide awake, and you can do your work. I love that you put even that in a historical context. Like, <laughs> like okay, that does make sense. Now you're going to have me going down the rabbit hole about biphasic sleep. Um, you know, I was so, first of all, when when we talk about you, we we have to talk about a whole gang of other people. You you are surrounded by such a huge um, community of other brilliant thinkers. You are part of some brilliant projects. You know, I mean, this is a podcast about writing. So even though most of our focus is going to be on this incredible debut, you know, I also have to shout out the fact that like you are an Emmy nominated writer for the Amber Ruffin Show. That's my logo. What? My show's got jokes. If you want to get rid of people who don't belong, get your pasty ass back on the Mayflower and go hell, my sketches. That is so true. And of course, thoughtful monologues on how to defeat systemic racism. All aboard the redemption train. You teach, you do so many things. Um, and I think like the balance thing is what I guess I was, I was curious about. Um, and this idea also of like bringing identity into everything that you do because one of the things I do love about your writing and just about you as a person is that you are not a person there is not a code switching thing that I see happen with you you are always you you are always like this is what it is I don't have any evidence that good cops exist and the new deal basically built America's middle class by giving money to white people so they were taking black people's tax money and using it to build a white middle class. What about the other Thomas Jefferson that no one ever talks about, right? By any measure, he was a racist. And I think you alluded a little bit to the fact that like that has something to do with growing up in a space that didn't ask you to, at least I guess in those most formative like early years. So like, tell me a little bit about, I would love to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, growing up, uh, being, being, Homeschooled by Dorothy Harriet and, and the middle room. Yeah, so... For people who don't, aren't familiar with that yet. Yeah. So <laughs> I grew up... You know, like one of the things that I'm lucky enough to say is, like, I have a family where, like, everyone was allowed and still is allowed to be whoever they are. And Grim. so I didn't have to worry about fitting in. And all the quirky, you know, weird parts of me were just like, that's Mikey. Um, and so I think that informed, like that gives me a sense of security. Like when everything swirls around you, you are grounded in knowing who you are, where you came from. And then like that extended to my hometown, um, mm -hmm. to, you know, my family, my friends. And in a sense, I was raised by this like big family slash community that kind of laid the foundation. And that's kind of the foundation of this book, right? It, it, I tell it through the eyes of my family, through stories of my family. Um, one of the premises of the book is that it's, if there is a capital of black America, then it is South Carolina, right? 40% uh, of enslaved people were disembarked from South Carolina. About 90% spent some time in South Carolina. So it's kind of the home of black people. So. <laughs> I was from like the center of black where, you know, the South Carolina culture, it, I argue in the book, an American culture is black culture that's been expanded into other kind of uh, geographies and other cultural uh -huh. norms 
but it's just all black culture. And I think that I, being grounded in that, like gives me a space to be comfortable enough to like wherever I expand into, I also know that this is where I'm from and who I am. For black Americans, South Carolina stands as the capital of the known world. Understanding the history and legacy of Africans in America and America itself cannot begin with the tea-tossing fret boys of Boston or even the self-righteous constitution writers of the North. America's fortune, fame, and even its independence began in South Carolina. So, Michael, on a personal note, I mean, you know, you were just talking about South Carolina and, you know, obviously it being the root of Black culture. I, I just found out recently, after years of thinking that my whole family was from Mississippi, that half of them are from South Carolina. I'm going to, I'm going to 96 South Carolina. Are you familiar with 96 South Carolina? Because I'm going there for my family reunion next year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you even know this, but um, one of my ex fiancés is... Uh, it's from Shut you know up. Eartha Kitt, um, yeah. Uh, wait, I I never uh, told you that Eartha Kitt, um, uh, like I'm technically almost Batman, right? Because Eartha Kitt, uh, yeah, she proposed to me, right? So, so for real, for real, for real. So, I am partly the reason Eartha Kitt knows where she's she's from. And you're right? saying she's from '96 so South Carolina. So Eartha Kitt was, <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah. So. When I, I used to work at, at Benedict College and we had like this dance production um, every year and Eartha Kitt agreed to come and perform in it. And so we, I had a class research her ancestry and find her actual birth certificate. She'd never known um, where she was from. She was the, she thought like the woman she thought was her mother was, I mean her mm -hmm. sister was actually her mother. And she moved away from there. Um, she was the, like her sister, her, the woman she thought was her sister was her mother who had had her with the wow. person who enslaved her family. And she moved away with her aunt and we found her birth certificate. And when she, we presented it to her, she proposed to me. And I thought about it, right? And I told her I'd get back to her on it. And, uh, you know, we never got back together but i think technically that makes me bad she was cat she was woman bad girl right so that technically makes me almost black man like i could have been batman so y'all don't even know like I, i'm, I'm I mean, like a low-key listen you're a superhero for fighting her whole genealogy and now i want to i'm gonna be I, let me call up ancestry i now i want to know if we're related if i'm related to eartha kids y'all ain't gonna be able to tell me nothing I could be related. You could be related we could like, have been related like, if you had just followed through 96 is really <laughs> small Yep. Oh my gosh! Yep, yep. We could have been like she's you part of the Chappelle family. Cousin, I'm part of the, the Chappelle of, of South Carolina, apparently. All right. Well, I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into that. I, I do want to get back to the book. <laughs> I, I love that we just got a, a Michael Harriet moment. A Michael Harriet moment of of that involves Eartha Kitt. Who knew? Who would have guessed that? All right. Well, we'll be back with more writing black. Y'all, come look at what Michael Harriet just posted. Black Twitter, come get your man. It's his podcast episodes for me. I was today years old when I found out Michael Harriet had a podcast. Subscribed. I'm world famous white peopleologist Michael Harriet, and this is The Griot Daily. That's right, the Black Twitter King has a podcast, The Griot Daily with Michael Harriet, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Griot Black Podcast Network and accessible wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Okay, and we are back with more Writing Black. You know, we have seen an uptick in, in people homeschooling. I think your mom was ahead of the times. She, she, she was on to something there. As an adult, she informed me that my early homeschooled education was an experiment due to her belief that a black child could not fully realize their humanity in the presence of whiteness. Although she drilled us on mathematics, grammar, and the Bible, our schooling was primarily self-directed, courtesy of the middle room. I read anything and everything, which led to many awkward incidents. Like the strange side eye I received at church after I read the autobiography of Malcolm X at nine years old, and begin ending every sentence with, if it is Allah's will. Do you see like kind of a model here for, um, you know, because we're, we're seeing this assault on American education, right? Which was already 
sketch to begin with in terms of history and how history was told. And we're seeing this further assault on it. Um, you know, when you write a book like this, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm sitting here, Pharrell Williams commenting on this book saying, among other things, this is what everyone wishes their high school courses, you know, were actually like true. Um, but do you see a model here? I mean, do you, would, would you promote a model like yours, the way that you grew up? Because it, it is so unique and it's so, and yet so organic. Yeah. And, and this is what you get, so, you know? So I think homeschooling, uh, you know, kind of made me who I am. Like I always say, like, I really didn't learn stuff in school. Um, but I don't know if homeschooling, like necessarily, like you are going to know more of your history through homeschooling. Yeah. So when you made that reference to the middle room, maybe I should explain there was a big room in my house where like my entire family and really my entire community deposited their books. I gravitated toward those history books because they were like true stories. But my education was like generally self-directed, right? Um, I was around a lot of people, like my family was heavily involved in a lot of pivotal events in the civil rights uh, movement, but like they never sat me down and said, you need to learn this, you need to do this. Like that was kind of my upbringing. So my education at the beginning was largely self-directed. So I think homeschooling can produce these results, but I don't know if like just sitting your child down in a room filled with books is going to always produce the right results. I think there has to be kind of a balance. And uh, like, luckily I got somewhat of a right balance, but I mean, I still have problems. Right? Like I get in trouble because when I went to school, because like I was almost out of high school before I could remember to write my name on the top of the paper. Right. So I had teachers that would give you a zero if you didn't write your name on the top of the paper or like to raise your hand if you want to use to the bathroom. That is a weird thing. And so like the socialization aspects I struggled with uh, when I went into a regular public high, public school. But I think there is a balance that could be achieved with homeschooling and a grounding mm -hmm. that would uh, direct someone throughout the rest of their life. Yeah, I mean, I was fascinated because I, I do think, again, I think we are all kind of, those of us who care about American education, particularly care about black people in American education, I, I'm looking for answers right now how to circumvent the system. But I want to I talk about more of that. We'll be right back with uh, more Michael Harriet and more Writing Black and more Black AF history. Y'all, come look at what Michael Harriet just posted. Black Twitter. Come get your man. It's his podcast episodes for me. I was today years old when I found out Michael Harriet had a podcast. Subscribed. I'm world famous white peopleologist Michael Harriet, and this is The Griot Daily. That's right, the Black Twitter King has a podcast, The Griot Daily with Michael Harriet, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Griot Black Podcast Network and accessible wherever you find your favorite podcasts. We're back with more writing Black and our guest today, Michael D. Harriet, my friend and colleague here at The Griot, who is you know the the brilliant the brilliant writer behind this book black a of history um where if you followed you know michael on the social media the platform formerly known as twitter as we say um you already know he is deep 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 in knowledge deep 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 in 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 blackness and really connecting the dots for people you know i think it's such a talent um you know, you, you talk about building a platform like, you know, you said, oh, I'm lucky to have this platform. I'm like, no, you you built a platform. You've built an audience. Um, how do you feel? I mean, obviously, that landscape is changing as well. Um, how do you feel about putting so much intellectual property into the universe? And how do you feel about, like, you know, the, the ways in which that landscape is changing as well? This, this landscape that you, you know, where you've really kind of you have built a platform and, and a very loyal audience of listeners. Yeah. So I think one of the things that like I have never understood is when people ask me like, well, give me some advice on how did you do it? And I, I always tell them like, I don't know. Um, I <laughs> like, and so Maisha has heard this y'all, but 
I always tell people, <laughs> I am like a 60 year old janitor and you tell me where to mop up the vomit. Uh, where well, you tell me where the vomit is and I'll mop it up. And so my thing has always been like, I just do the work, I write. And Vision. sometimes I'm writing for the Griot, sometimes I write it for Twitter, sometimes I write it for a television show. Um, and, but the intellectual property that we call it, but the stuff that you put into the world, you just put it into the world. And I don't know if I necessarily have this like grand plan or an objective of what I want that to look like or, or where I want to end up because of, it, right. So I am more concerned with doing the work and I feel like all the other stuff will take care of itself. If you just put out enough work that, you know, people will can see, then like, somebody will like this and somebody will like that. But the, I don't know if there's a grand scheme, but I, I think that with anything, you if you worry about the work and doing the work and, and building yourself a set of skills, then someone will notice that and how you monetize it and how you uh, translate that into whatever you want to do, you will get that, but you have to have the work first, right? Like nobody is going to believe you because like, I'm a great writer or I'm a great historian. Um, you know, you just put the writing out there and put the history out there and you let other people tell you uh, or, or read it and judge for themselves. Um, I love that answer because it's such a writer's answer too. I think like there is that thing that happens, like even when you know you're a great writer, it's like, you know, that's why I'm asking you questions about time. I'm asking you questions about space, intellectual property. And we do sometimes forget, I think, you know, because we are in a world that's like produce, 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 and we we stop producing, <laughs> ironically. Um, you know, I, I you are incredibly prolific. I, um, you know, I, I'm so struck by that answer. I love that answer so much. Um, but you also... You approach things, and this is something I always marvel at with you, because, I, of course, having worked together for so long, I have seen firsthand some of the stuff that you encounter in terms of, um, I guess, backlash would be the best way to say it. You know, you say in the book, uh, you point out very early and very clearly that, you know, not only is this a book that's not centered around whiteness, but really calling out the concept of whiteness for what it is, which is whiteness is fear. And we've seen how that fear, how destructive that fear can be. How do you navigate? I mean, you know, there's there's obviously the fear that a lot of us creators have, you know, in terms of getting ourselves out into the universe and, and what we have to say out into the universe. But how do you navigate the response to what I can only call, you know, just typical Michael honesty, like, well, no, this is just what it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, well part of that is grounded in, again, always knowing that you have a home, you have a family, you have a community around you, and that extends to just black people in general. And some of it is that one thing I make clear in the book is that a, a lot of times that pushback is because white people do not know what they're talking about. A white person cannot tell me anything about almost anything black, right? They don't know history, they don't know what it's like to live in this country as a black person. So when those people, you know, push back, I know that it's coming from a place of someone who, to put for lack of a better word, they're dumb, right? And we live in a country where they are used to not being called out on their stupidity, right? So like the stupidity of whiteness is self-perpetuating because nobody says, hey, white people are wrong, right? Like they all, they are more likely to say something wrong and think it's right because nobody's gonna say, hey, y'all wrong about this, right? So a lot of it is that like dumb people shouldn't be listened to. Um, like my mama used to say all the time, you know, like if there's such a thing as average intelligence, then at least half of the people are below average, right? And so a lot of those people still have computers, they still got email addresses, and they can reach out to me. But again, I know 
that what I am talking about, when they push back, it's from a perspective of dumbness. And I kind of don't have any interest in dissecting or like spending my time wondering about why dumb people act dumb. <laughs> That's such a great answer. Why do dumb people act dumb? Um, you know, we were talking about intellectual property a second ago, and I wanted to clarify a couple of things because, you know, you're wearing a black AF t shirt. Um, for those of our listeners who are not seeing Michael, that's what he's wearing. Obviously, that's the name. That's a reference to this book as well. There's also the phrase white people. <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about adding new phrases and words into the lexicon? I don't know that you always get the credit that you deserve, but I know that some of these things started with you. And I just want to verify that just for my own edification. And again, talk about what does it feel like when people are just like start using these phrases like indiscriminately, just like it's just out there. So, yeah, um, I don't know if I'd heard Black AF before I started mm -hmm. uh, using it. Actually, so like a, a lot of people don't know that I am a poet also. And I would, uh, you know, go to spoken word venues. And of course, when you were, you know, Spoken word is like, it ain't like I'm Beyonce of spoken word, right? So even the most popular spoken word person, they kind of have to figure out a way to make money to spread their art, right? And so I would sell these t-shirts like across the country, like is like in the two or in the early 2000s, right? I, I started uh, selling these t-shirts called, they were just black AF and uh, people would buy them. And I don't know if like the TV show and the other people who like saw the t-shirts or heard me use the words in my writing, but uh, you're like, nope, they can't challenge me. Like I've even had, uh, you know, phone calls with, you know, the creator of uh, the TV show, Black, what's it, Black AF. You know, there is no, uh, you know, trademark infringement because like I was doing it first and the same thing with mm -hmm. white people and, uh, and like some of the stuff catches on and some of it, some of it don't like all of this stuff. Like you can look in my right, like invited to the cookout. Right. Um, <laughs> like it just popped years ago. And like, I don't be, I don't walk around and be like, yo, you know, that's, that's my thing. Because again, you do the work and some people like it. And some, sometimes it catches on and sometimes it doesn't. Right. And so uh, the stuff that catches on, you kind of keep moving on. You use it, but you keep moving on and trying to create new things and, and new ideas and put new things into the public lexicon. But uh, I don't really spend much time like arguing with people or trying to say, you know, I deserve credit for it because, like, I don't know if they're, what, I mean, what do I get for the credit? Like, there ain't no Black AF Oscars or cultural phrase Oscars. <laughs> Or but there Emmys. should be. <laughs> um, so it's just a thing that's out there. You know, and it's such, you are such a gift to the culture. I'll, I'll put it to you this way, though. It does catch on because my 75-year-old mother one day just casually was like, well, you know, why people? And I said, excuse me, <laughs> what's happening right now? So listen, it catches on. It's generational. It is a gift. Um, <laughs> you are so hilarious to yeah. me. And it actually um, started because, like you remember when Facebook was uh, flagging posts that just said white people. And so it was like yes. my way of getting around like social media flags. And now it emerged into a, like a cultural phrase. <laughs> well, you know, as you, this, this segues us nicely because, you know, as you already explained to us, um, there is another book on the way that we can expect uh, that has white peopleology, I believe you said yes. it is called. Um, now, you know, obviously, our focus right now is on Black AF history, but how do these two, are these companion pieces, like how do these two uh, books work together? Yeah, there'll be a companion piece. So Black AF history is, you know, history. White people, mm -hmm. uh, white peopleology is more of kind of a sociological, uh, is grounded in economic theory. And so sure. it'll explain stuff that like, you know, why do white people always talk about Black on Black crime? Like is Black on Black crime a thing? And then we'll examine that. Or, you know, um, like, for instance, we ask the question and use economic theory to look to investigate, like, 
are black people more athletic? Why can't white people clap on beat? Um, like if we talk about that in real terms, like in a in joke, it's a joke, but there are historical and cultural differences, right? It's in, funny because it's true. Right, right. <laughs> and so we examine that. We examine stuff like, well, like why do we season our food better, right? Um, there are actual reasons for that, and we explore those things in white ecology because the, the basis of it, the basis of that idea is that, like, if you want to know about racism and white supremacy and how America works, you can't learn it by just focusing on black people because black people didn't, incre didn't create race. We didn't create white supremacy. We didn't create racism. We don't perpetrate it. So you have to understand white people, thus white peopleology. I cannot wait. I really can't. You also have uh, a, a podcast forthcoming uh, that I've heard some things about. I, I want to hear a little more about that. We don't, we don't always promote non-Griot podcasts, but you are Griot fam. We want to know what you're up to. I don't know how you're fitting another thing into your already very full plate, but tell me about, is it, it's Draped Maniacs? Is that, yep, draped do I have that right? So Drapetomania <laughs> was this idea that was an actual medical um, diagnosis mm -hmm. that black people's desire for freedom was a mental illness. So we took that idea and expanded it. And so Drapetomaniac is like if the Chappelle show met the 1619 Project, right? It is, we take a person or an event every week and it, we use celebrity guests to voice the characters. And it's like an episode of uh, a real history that investigates, um, you know, one of these people and, and why they were a dreptomaniac. For instance, we use, like we, we have an episode upcoming about Ida B. Wells. And so we asked some of you, like I can't reveal the names yet, but some of your <laughs> favorite rappers are taking Ida B. Wells' writings and translating them into battle rap. So it's the mini beefs of Ida B. Wells. So when she was beefing with Booker T. Washington, you're going to hear Ida B. Wells rap against Booker T. Washington. You're going to hear her spit game at white suffragettes, <laughs> right? Like, and so that's what Drapetomaniacs is, right? It's funny. It's, you'll recognize the voices because they're from the culture, but it is history made funny and, and interesting. We use music, we musicians contribute. So it's, it's really interesting. The sound design is really interesting and it's made by black people from across the world. So our staff has people like, I'll be in a meeting and the sound engineer is saying, hey, you got, hold on for a second, my monkeys are outside, because she's in Kenya and she has monkeys, right? Um, or, you know, I'll have to do something in the middle of the night because my producer is, in, is an expat who lives in Amsterdam. So it is really interesting, and it's really interesting to hear all of these perspectives in this podcast, mm -hmm. and, it's, and you'll have, like, uh, for instance, um, Roland Martin, uh, Yvette Nicole Brown was in, uh, uh, one of our episodes, Charlemagne the God, like everybody that you, from the culture that you know, <laughs> you're going to hear their voices in this podcast. Well, I mean, it speaks to your your appeal and your strength that you were able to get all those names, but I, I can't wait to hear it. It sounds hilarious. Um, back to this new release, though. Um, you know, I kind of asked you a variation on this earlier, but I'm going to ask you again, like, do you have any hopes for this book? Like, how do you hope that it sits in the lexicon now? Because as you stated, there are a lot of black history books. You know, we, we've we seen this surge in, in interest in black writers over the last several years. We know why. But, you know, this is such an important book. And I personally am, you know, excited to be part of helping you, uh, you know, get the word out. But how do you hope people engage with this? And how do you hope they use it? And you know, will it will it be the worst thing in the world if it ends up in a classroom? It won't be. Um, what what my hope for this book is that it's one of those books that is in every mi middle room in every home and, and on every bookshelf. Mm -hmm. And so, like, not just on the bestseller list, you know, when it comes out, but like 15, 20 years from now, some child like me will be wandering through their version of the middle room. And it's like, what is this? book and open it and start reading it the same way I read the black book, same way 
I went, read uh, Before the Mayflower or The Souls of Black Folk, one of those books, right, that is on black bookshelves and is passed along and becomes part of our documentation of our history. Well, it is definitely going to be uh, on my Christmas list this year, being sent out to my family, who I think will enjoy it greatly. But, um, you know, we know that behind every great writer, especially a writer like you, there's a lot of reading. You've talked about a lot of books in this podcast. I do want to also, again, shout out Blair Kelly, who had a big part of Black AF history. But who do you read? You know, like, who are, who are you reading? Who excites you? Um, who for, further informs your work? Uh, so... I love, uh, one of my favorite writers is uh, Paul Beatty. I am a huge Paul Beatty uh, fan. Um, Greg Tate is probably my biggest sure, sure. influence along with Paul Beatty. Um, Chester Heim, uh, who is like, those are the, you know, the Mount Olympus or the, the what's that mountain in North Dakota that the white people face on? Like Mount Rushmore. Rushmore. That's your, um, that's your, your Mount Blackmore. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so those, those, I read those people and currently I'm reading like Blair Kelly. I'm reading, you know, the black authors that are around today. Of course, I'm a big fan of like, uh, of Damon Young, you know, who, who is one of our colleagues, right? Um, yes, we love Damon Young. And, and so I, I read people from today. I read, uh, I'm a huge Zora Neale Hurston fan. Like she's. She's the fourth face on that Mount Olympic, uh, that Mount Rushmore mm -hmm. uh, for me, mm -hmm. and so uh, that's who I read. I read old stuff. I read new stuff. I read anything interesting and funny and intelligent. Well, you are all of the above. Um, I cannot thank you enough for coming and sharing some insights and just yourself with us. I also can't thank you enough for being my friend. I think you know it's it's you are such a delight and you're so brilliant. And I am hoping for nothing but the best for this book and the ones to follow. Michael Harriet, y'all. Thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure, always. Y'all, come look at what Michael Harriet just posted. Black Twitter, come get your man. It's his podcast episodes for me. I was today years old when I found out Michael Harriet had a podcast. Subscribed. I'm world-famous white peopleologist Michael Harriet, and this is The Griot Daily. That's right, the Black Twitter King has a podcast, The Griot Daily with Michael Harriet, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Griot Black Podcast Network, and accessible wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Well, as I expected, that was an amazing conversation with my good friend Michael Harriet. I, I'm so proud to call him my friend, so proud of this book, Black AF History, even though I had nothing to do with it. But highly recommend you picking that up. Also, pick up Blair Kelly's Black Folk, The Roots of the Black Working Class, which is going to give you even more dimension, more history. Uh, that is one of my favorites this week, because, you know, this is the portion of the show where I give you my favorites, recommended reading. Um, I'm also going to recommend uh, another great commentator who is always insightful on political issues, Ellie Stiles, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. And what I love about all three of these books is, again, you know, exactly what Michael was talking about, us not needing to look at our history through the, anybody else's lens. We have our own perspective. We have our own experience. And it is valid and it is real and it is ours, just like this podcast is yours. So please come back again and join us for more Writing Black. We'll see you then. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. 